Well, hello, shalom. Welcome to our teaching on tithes and offerings, part two. Now, if you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to go back and have a look at it before you move on to this one. But just re quickly reviewing a bit on uh, part one is that we can't actually do the biblical tithe as it was an agricultural things that they tithed from. For example, the, the harvest of grains, the, uh, the fruits of the trees and, and the animals. And it was tithed to the Levites, the poor, widows and orphans and also the stranger. So in that regard, we can't do the tithe as taught in the scriptures. And one thing I also wanted to bring out is that there were certain people that were exempted from tithing because they didn't have the ability or means to. So in Deuteronomy 26 verse 12 it says, When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the, tithe, uh, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. So here we're just reviewing the reference to who the tithe went to and what it was for in ancient times in, in Israel's history. But this week we're going to be discussing what it, all this means for us today and in the New Testament. We know that they gave. And they also gave offerings. Now there are a few words translated as offerings in Hebrew. And we will go through a couple of them in this teaching. The first Hebrew word for offering is korban. And it means to come near, to approach, come close. It is the bringing, giving or approaching of someone or something to be close, at hand or among. So this is the, the Hebrew word korban. So when they gave their offerings as laid out in Leviticus, they were doing it to draw near to Yahweh, to come close to Yahweh through their offerings. That's what this word means, to draw near and come close. Another Hebrew word for offerings or giving is minka. And it means a gift, tribute or offering. A gift is what is brought to another. Translated also as a grain offering, the minka offering or tribute and gift. And this word minka comes from another Hebrew word, naka. Naka, and it means to satisfy and lead to self-endorsed goal. So this is where this word minka comes from, naka. Also, naka means to please and satisfy. These are all the same family of words. Naka and nakak means to please, satisfy. And they all come from the same family. The word for give in Hebrew is natan or nathan. And it means to give, put or set in Hebrew. And I want to go through the first occurrence of this word, Natan, in our Bibles, which is found in Genesis 1.17. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. So this is the first occurrence of this word, Natan, or Nathan, in our Bibles, is to give light on the earth. Giving is one of the foundations for life. In the beginning God gave 
and created. Yeshua gave everything. His life that we may live. Giving and receiving is what makes the world go round. God gave light, water, animals, trees and plants so that we could live. It happens in the business world. We give money and we receive an item, whether that would be food, clothing or whatever the case is. We give something and we receive something. It is a cycle of giving and receiving. We see this pattern in the Levitical system also. The Levites gave teaching, judgment, their service, their labour in the uh, tabernacle and the temple. That's what they were to do. They were to be the mediators through officiating and, and doing the sacrifices in the, in the tabernacle and temple on behalf of the nation. So they were giving. That was their life. And um, they were doing that on behalf of the whole nation. And, and in return, the nation gave to them and supported them and looked after them. And we can learn a lot from the pictograph in the meaning of giving. So let's have a look at that now. Here is the pictograph of the Hebrew word Natan, giving. And we have a noon, a tau, and a noon. Now in the pictograph language, every letter means something. And the noon means life, seed, living. And the tau also means a mark, sign, and covenant. So when you put these two meanings together of the noon and the tau, you see, we see that the seed of life brings the mark of the covenant that brings life. So life, covenant, brings life. That's what the meaning of this word Natan is in the pictograph. You know, amazing. The Hebrew language is a wonderful language. Now let's go through the New Testament. I suggest that the tithes, offerings and giving are patterns and shadows for believers in the New Testament and also for us today. For us today, it would mainly be the offerings and giving, which are pretty much the same thing. When an offering or giving is done with the right heart and motive, one is drawing near to Yahweh. Just like that word Corbin that we went through earlier. We need to understand as believers, everything comes from Yahweh. Our jobs, finances, time, our gifts as in skills and abilities. These are all given to us for a purpose. All for the edification and building up of his body or his house. Now, I heard this statement a fair while ago. Giving, making offerings, contrib contributing, is not an investment. It is a commandment. Yes, there are promises that Yahweh says that will happen, that we will be blessed and prosperous, but this should not be our motivation. It is to bring life and, and contribute and edify and lift up. Matthew 6, 24, and it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Again in Matthew 6, verses 1 to 4, and it says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now I just want to touch on this about uh, the trumpet, where he says where they, they, they sound a trumpet. The trumpet were the wooden boxes in the women's court of the temple. And they had a trumpet-shaped funnel that guided the coins into the wooden box. Now the sound that these coins made against the metal would have indicated how much people were giving or offering. This sheds a lot more light on to the story of the widow that gave two mites. Those two little coins wouldn't have made much noise. And in this passage that we just read out in Matthew 6, he's saying, do not be like the hypocrites that give out of their abundance and, and, and sound the trumpet so everyone could turn around and, and acknowledge and recognize how much was being given because of the amount of coins that were rattling against a metal-shaped funnel. It was to draw attention, look how much I'm giving. Here we have another verse in Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these tithes, uh, all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Quite a powerful understanding in that light. In Luke 6.38 it says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will it be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. Now this is used so much by, by many denominations and churches promoting giving and offering and giving to the ministry. But this verse that we just read out is not about money. It can be, but the context is not about giving money and receiving a heap back. The context is loving your enemies, doing good, lending without expecting anything in return. Hmm. This is very opposite to what this the way this verse is being taught today, with expecting a return. So this is about showing mercy and not judging, not condemning and being forgiven. Go back three or four verses from 38 to get the context of verse 38. And it shows you, it reveals to you that it's about not judging, showing mercy, not condemning and being someone that forgives. Go back and read it for yourself. Philippians 4, 14 to 19. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ephroditus, the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. 
And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Messiah Yeshua. So here we see an example of New Testament contribution, offering, giving. This is an example of a fellowship supporting someone who ministers, Paul. The Philippians were the only ones who gave and supported Paul in this context. So it's an example of the community, the assembly, the congregation supporting one who ministers. In 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, it says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the labourer is worthy of his wages. So again we see here the the people taught to offer and support and honour those that labour in the word and doctrine. And this is this he's quoting directly from Deuteronomy twenty five four. So he's using something that's in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Torah, supporting the New Testament and making offerings they they weren't finished or done away with. And in another verse, in 1 Corinthians 9, 3-14, My defence to those who examine me is this, Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? And do also, uh, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Or whoever goes to war at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? Verse 9. For it is written in the Torah of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who ploughs should plough in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things to you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Messiah. Verse 13. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the holy, uh, eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, Yahweh has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So here we see Paul writing in his letters to the Corinthians about sustaining, contributing, making offerings. And they have a right to do so, but they, they chose to refrain from it because they didn't want to hinder the gospel. But that doesn't mean that that shouldn't be done. So I have absolutely no problem with preachers and teachers receiving offerings and gifts from the believers to live on. There's no problem, there's no issue with that. I do, however, have a problem, as we showed in part one, with overindulgence, greed, and the corruption of those contributions and offerings that people make. The tithes and offerings were going mostly to the Levites, So this is the pattern for today. Pastors and teachers do a similar role when that is done properly. They should be teaching and leading the people how to follow Yahweh. And then the whole assembly and congregation is blessed. We see the giving, receiving pattern here. But sadly, many pastors and teachers are not teaching the people because they have thrown out the teachings and instructions that were given by Yahweh. 
This is why the majority of churches struggle, except the few megachurches. 1 Timothy 6, 17-19 Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So the rich are responsible for giving more, not just the so-called 10%. 10% to a millionaire is not the same as 10% for someone that's on a low income. Matthew 6, 19-23 Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The lamp of the, uh, the, lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And then the rest of the passage goes on about uh, talking about not worrying about what you will eat or wear. That Yahweh will provide. But there is also an idiom within this passage that we just read out that I need to explain. The good eye means that you are a generous person, one that gives. And the evil eye is a stingy person, one who withholds. Matthew nineteen sixteen to 22 Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? that I may have eternal life. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Yeshua said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Friends, this is not about selling everything. But it could be if Yahweh tells you to do that. It is about the heart because he went away sorrowful with a heavy heart because he had great possessions. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 9 Then the people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to Yahweh and King David also rejoiced greatly. Now the context of this verse was the building of a temple and the people gave just like they did in the Exodus for the building of the tabernacle. And it's all about the heart. We give an offer because we want to please Yahweh and do what he commanded us to do. It takes money to spread the message, to spread the gospel. It takes money to have a place of worship. It takes money to have teachers and as to do it properly and learn the instructions and teachings of Yahweh is like having a full-time job. This is why the Levites were provided for. They could not work and do the service and teaching at the same time. They could not work and do the service and teachings of the, te- of the tabernacle and the temple. They couldn't do it. It was either one or the other. 
And it was they they were called to labor and teach and and do all the things that the Levites did. Like today, those who teach and preach properly cannot effectively work a full-time job and learn the Torah and then teach the people. This is extremely difficult to do that. It takes hours of study and learning to do this properly. 2 Corinthians 8, 1-5 Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to Yahweh and then to us by the will of God. See, they gave and supported different fellowships also, as we just read out. Proverbs 11.25 The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Proverbs 19.17 He who has pity on the poor lends to Yahweh, and he will pay back what he has given. Wow, what a what a powerful verse. Proverbs 21.13 Whoever shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Wow, that's a pretty powerful verse also. And Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labour will increase. And again in Proverbs 23, 4. Do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. Stop. Do not overwork. Do not overwork to be rich. Do not keep working. Cease. Stop. Rest. Maybe they were working on the Sabbath. Who knows? 2 Corinthians 9, 6-12 But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Verse 9, As it is written, He has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving, through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is uh, also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Psalm 37, 25. I love this verse from David. It says, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful testimony to Yahweh's provision for the righteous. And I could just keep going on and on with scripture after scripture about giving. The fact of the matter is that they gave in the New Testament. It was endorsed by Yeshua and the apostles. In most cases, it was far more than 10%. For example, the widow in her she gave all her livelihood. 
Also, I need to make it clear, I am not only talking about money. We can also talk about our giftings, our abilities, our time, our love, our prayers. And all those other things are are included in this. So to to wrap all this up, to finish this this, this series on tithes and offerings, the Old Testament lays out the principles, foundations and meanings of what the tithes and offerings and gifts are. They were predominantly agricultural and given to Yahweh and the Levites and the strangers and the widows and the fatherless. And they serve as a pattern for us today. Pastors and teachers can live off the offerings and gifts of the congregation, but not in greed and overindulgence. A good teacher and pastor equips the rest of the body to live and be holy so the body can be a light unto the nations. The poor, the widow and the stranger, I believe we can still help, even though I hold to the idea that a Western society, much of this is done through the taxes which are taken. However, I believe if you are led by the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, one needs to follow that leading. And also as a congregation, this can be done. Giving makes the world go round, both in the natural and the spiritual. Giving is what promotes life and helps society work and nature. You can see the giving and taking in nature. It always comes back to the heart. Giving by being obedient and pleasing to Yahweh. Again, we give to please Yahweh so we can draw near to Him and be close to Him. To bring life through giving. And again, we see this slide with what it was like in the Old Testament with the the grapes and the grains representing the the harvest times when they brought their offerings and tributes to the temple. A lot of it was done around the harvest of their produce. Today we can make offerings and gifts to Yahweh and the work of his kingdom to support preachers and teachers, to support the needy, needy among us and among the world and supporting other fellowships, giving to charities, but please know what you are giving to with charities, as some claim a belief in God but stand for and support terrible things that we are told not to do. So really investigate and do your diligence, due diligence on the charity that you're supporting. And they all gave willingly to the building of a tabernacle and to providing for the Levitical priesthood This is all seen in the Exodus. This is all an example for us today. So yes, we we plainly see see that that we can still make offerings and contributions in many ways, shapes and forms today. So I encourage you to have that as part of your life. And, and, And like David said, I have been young and I have been old and I have never seen the righteous begging for bread. What a powerful testimony. May that also be you and me. So I really hope that you've enjoyed this, this teaching on tithes and offerings. It's given you a better understanding of what it is from a biblical perspective, not a redefined 21st century perspective. So may you be led by the Holy Spirit in this area and draw near to Yahweh. So, Father, we thank you for your word, and your word is truth. Father, I pray that as we weigh these matters in our heart, that your spirit would speak to us, would would guide us and lead us. Father, that we would be people that are cheerful in our giving, and that we would do it with a heart that wants to draw near to you, not to be seen by others, not to sound a trumpet, but to do it in in a manner and in a way that is pleasing to you that we can be a blessing to to others. Father, help us to be those people. And we thank you and praise you, Father, for your word, and your word is truth. Well, again, I I hope this has been a blessing and encouragement to you. So until next time.
May Yahweh watch over you and your loved ones. May Yahweh protect you and bless you in all that you put your hand to do. Until next time, Shalom. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.